In these lectures, we will discuss the application of networks to the study of systemic risk. So in the first lecture, we will discuss the simple model of global cascades in random networks that was introduced by Duncan Watts in 2002. In the second lecture, we will discuss the application of this model to uh, model contagion in financial networks. The third lecture will also be uh, devoted to financial contagion, but we will look at a different class of models, and in particular, the debt rank algorithm. So the first lecture will be about the uh, model of global cascades introduced by Duncan Watts. So the model is relatively simple, but it has a rich phenomenology, so it's quite, uh, it, it is quite useful and important. So in the model we have a population of n agents um, that are interacting in a network. Each node in the network can be in any of two states, either active or inactive. And there is a simple dynamical rule for nodes to become active. So a node which is inactive becomes active if the fraction of its active neighbors exceeds a given threshold. So it's a very simple model. The interpretation of the model is, for instance, in terms of the propagation of news, information, or the adoption of uh, innovations in a population of agents. So we are in particular interested in understanding under what conditions a, uh, the activation of a node, of a single node at the beginning, will trigger a global cascade in the network and eventually lead to a large uh, number of nodes to be active. So here by global cascade, what we mean is a situation in which an extensive number of nodes becomes active in the thermodynamic limit. So uh, when we consider the limit of large networks, when the number of nodes goes to infinity, we want to uh, observe a situation where in this limit, the fraction of nodes that are active is strictly larger than zero. So in the limit when n goes to infinity, the number of active nodes divided by the number of nodes must be strictly larger than zero. If this happens, we say that there is a global cascade. So in the following, we will be interested in understanding when we have a non-zero probability of observing these global cascades. And the problem is similar to that of computing the giant component of a random network, uh, with the difference that now each node has a threshold for being active, while uh, when we compute the giant component, that's not the case. Nodes are in the giant component as long as they are connected to other nodes in the giant component. So what we will really have to do is to compute the size of the largest component of active nodes and understand when this is uh, larger than zero. So in the following, what we are going to do is to derive equations that are satisfied by the probability of observing uh, large cascades in, in the network and then derive a condition for the existence of global cascades as a function of parameters such as the average degree and the threshold for uh, node activation. So to understand when global cascades can occur, um, a useful concept is the one of vulnerable cluster. First definition that is useful is the one of vulnerable node. We define a vulnerable node as a node that becomes active uh, if at least one of its neighbors is active. So this is a node which is very easy to activate because as soon as one neighbor is active, the node becomes active. So a vulnerable cluster is just a set of vulnerable nodes that are connected between them through paths. It's a component uh, made of vulnerable nodes. So given the definition of vulnerable node and vulnerable cluster, one can understand that if a, a node that belongs to the vulnerable cluster be, is activated, then eventually the whole cluster will be, uh, will be activated. And that's because uh, all the nodes in the vulnerable cluster are vulnerable. So one of their neighbors being active is enough uh, for them to become active. And so if we insert an active node uh, into this cluster, this eventually uh, will be able to, uh, to activate all the remaining nodes. So the question here is really uh, to understand when there is uh, a vulnerable cluster which is giant, so which um, is made of a non-vanishing fraction of nodes in the thermodynamic limit. 
So this is a pictorial representation of uh, the vulnerable cluster. Here we have a network which is made of the uh, red nodes, the yellow nodes, and the blue nodes. And you should imagine that the blue nodes are, so this is just a part of the network. The blue nodes will be connected to other nodes in the system. So the vulnerable cluster here is represented by the red nodes. And so uh, as soon as one of the red nodes become active, all of them will eventually uh, become active because of the dynamical rule that we have and the fact that they are vulnerable. There is another useful concept, which is the one of extended vulnerable cluster, which is the vulnerable cluster plus the nodes that are neighbors of those in the vulnerable cluster, but they are not vulnerable themselves. So this is a useful concept because you can understand that if you activate one node which um, belongs to the extended vulnerable cluster, even if the node is not vulnerable itself, so if we activate one of the um, yellow nodes here, eventually all of the red nodes will become active. So if we are interested in computing the probability that if we select a, uh, a node randomly to be our uh, unique active node at time zero, so if you are interested in computing the probability that eventually a global cascade will occur, we are interested in computing the size of the extended vulnerable cluster. Because the size of the extended vulnerable cluster is the probability that if we select a random node to be active at time zero, uh, eventually the um, vulnerable cluster will become active. So what we will do in the following is to derive a condition for uh, the size of the extended vulnerable cluster to be larger than zero. So we define S as the probability that a node belongs to the extended giant vulnerable cluster, or actually it is just the extended vulnerable cluster. We, we want to know whether it's giant, so if S will be larger than zero, then it will be uh, giant, otherwise it will not be giant. And S prime is instead the probability that if we follow a link, we reach a node that belongs to the vulnerable cluster. So here we are imagining a situation in which the network is drawn from the configuration model, so the degree sequence is fixed and then links are uh, randomly, uh, randomly arranged in the network. So imagine that we pick, uh, so we try now to write the equations which is satisfied by S, which is the probability that a node is in the extended vulnerable cluster. So imagine that we randomly select a node, this green node here, and let's assume that the node has degree K. So we want to compute the probability that this node belongs to the extended vulnerable cluster. So if the node belong, belongs to the extended vulnerable cluster, it means that at least one of its neighbors belongs to the vulnerable cluster. So we have to compute the probability that at least uh, one of the neighbors of the green node belongs to the extended uh, to the vulnerable cluster. 1 minus s prime is the probability that by following a link we do not reach the vulnerable cluster. So 1 minus s prime to the power k is the probability that the green node is not connected to the vulnerable cluster because by following any of its links, we do not reach the vulnerable cluster. So one minus this quantity is the probability that the green node has at least one neighbor that belongs to the uh, vulnerable cluster. So this is a probability which is conditional on the uh, node having degree k. If we want the unconditional probability, we have to average over the degree distribution that we denote by p of k, and so this is the equation which is satisfied by S, the probability that a node is in the extended vulnerable cluster. So we are interested in understanding whether this equation has a solution for which S is larger than zero, and when does this happen as a function of the parameters in the model. So to uh, solve this equation, we need now another equation for S prime, which is the probability that following a link, we reach a node in the vulnerable cluster. So we imagine now that we follow a link and we find a node, this red node. So 
let's assume again that this node uh, has degree k. So first of all, uh, if by following a link, we are trying to compute the probability to, to reach a node in the vulnerable cluster. Uh, so first of all, the node that we reach must be vulnerable. So it must be uh, true that 1 over k minus phi is larger than 0. Here I am assuming that the threshold is the same for all nodes for simplicity, but a uh, generalization of the condition that we that we will derive can be um, can be derived also for the case where there is a probability distribution for these variables v. So this uh, theta function is just making sure it's just checking that the node that we reached is vulnerable, so can belong to the extended vulnerable. Uh, sorry, can belong to the vulnerable cluster. Then what we have to do is to compute the probability that the node is connected to the vulnerable cluster. So if the node is in the vulnerable cluster, it means that uh, at least one of its neighbors is also in the vulnerable cluster. And here uh, we are not uh, taking into account the link we are coming from. So we want to compute the probability that the node, the red node that we found by following a link, is connected to the vulnerable to the vulnerable cluster through the other links, other than the one we are coming from. Basically, one minus s prime is, as before, the probability that if we follow one of the links, we do not reach the vulnerable cluster. So it's the probability that one of the blue nodes is not in the vulnerable in the vulnerable cluster. Then y, 1 minus s prime to the power k minus 1 is the probability that all of the blue nodes are not in the vulnerable cluster. So 1 minus 1 minus s prime to the power k minus 1 is the probability that at least one of the blue nodes that are neighbors of the red node that we found following a link, at least one of the blue nodes belongs to the vulnerable cluster. So that's the quantity we, uh, we were after. Of course, we had to uh, so this again is the conditional probability, conditional on the fact that the red node has degree k, we have to average over the degree distribution of the red node. The degree distribution of the red node is not the degree distribution p of k, because p of k is the probability distribution that is the probability that we select a node with degree k if we randomly uh, randomly pick one node in the network with uniform probability. Uh, while here we are not selecting uh, nodes randomly, we are uh, selecting a link randomly, following the link, and then looking at the node that we, uh, that we reach. So the probability that the node that we reach has degree k is not p of k, but it's k times p of k divided by the average degree, essentially because uh, the higher the degree of a node, the higher the probability that the node can be found uh, by, uh, by following links, because the node has more, uh, is attached to more links. So this is our equation for uh, the quantity S prime. So what we have to do now is to solve these two equations in order to uh, find uh, the size of the extended vulnerable cluster, S, which is uh, equivalent to the probability of uh, observing a global cascade given that we activate uh, one random node at time zero. So we are interested in understanding when S is larger than zero. So first of all, we notice that S equal to zero and S prime equal to zero is always a solution of these two equations. So if s prime is equal to zero, also s is equal to zero, and s prime equal to zero is a solution of this equation. And that in order to have a solution uh, where s is larger than zero, we need to have a solution of the second equation with s prime larger than zero. So what we will do in the, in the following is just to focus on the second equation and try to derive a condition for the existence of a solution uh, of a non-zero solution of this equation. So to do that, uh, what we can do is to study the right-hand side of this uh, equation. So we define the function g of s prime, which is the right-hand side of the equation. 
and we note that g of 0 is equal to 0 and that g of 1 is smaller than 1. Then if we take the first and the second derivatives, we can see that the first derivative of g is larger than 0 for all values of s prime, which means that the function is increasing. And the second derivative is smaller than 0 for all values of s prime, which means that the function is concave. So now we can uh, use a graphical method to, um, to look for the solutions of this equation. So the red line in these plots corresponds to the left-hand side of the equation. So it's a straight line with slope 1, which corresponds to s prime. The black curve corresponds to g of s prime, which is the right-hand side of the equation. So we have a solution of the equation when the two, uh, the two lines cross. And there are two possible situations. So of course the, red cur the black curve, we know it's increasing and concave, it starts from 0 and ends up somewhere uh, below 1 at s prime equal to 1. So there are two situations. One in which the black curve is always below the red line. Of course, they start together at zero, but then the black curve is always below the red line. And so there is no other solution other than no solution other than s prime equal to zero for the equation. The second situation is the one in which instead the um, two cur curves start together at s prime equal to zero, then the black curve is above the, uh, the red line for a while, and then eventually the two cross, and uh, a second solution appears with s prime larger than zero. So what discriminates between these two conditions, these two situations, is uh, the value of the derivative of the red of the um, black curve in computed in s prime equal to zero. If the derivative is larger than zero, then it means that the black curve is, um, is increasing faster in zero than the red curve, the, the red line. So therefore, in the vicinity of zero, the uh, black curve will be above the red line, and so there will be another solution. If instead the first derivative of the black curve is smaller than one, then uh, the two curves start together, but then the, uh, the, the red line will, will grow faster in zero, and so the black curve, then the black curve, and the black curve will always be below, uh, below the straight line. So the condition for the existence of a global cascade is that the first derivative of the function g, computed in s prime equal to zero, is larger than one. So the first derivative is this one, if we compute it in s prime equal to 0, and we ask that the outcome is uh, larger than 1, we uh, find this relationship. So notice that this relationship is uh, a generalization of the Molloy and Reed criterion for the emergence of a giant component in a network. Indeed, if uh, phi is equal to 0, then uh, we recover the molloy rate criterion, because if phi is equal to zero, it means that there is uh, no activation threshold for nodes to be in, uh, uh, in the vulnerable cluster. So uh, all nodes in the giant component are, uh, are vulnerable, and therefore we get the same, the same relationship. So let's look at uh, a specific example now. Let's look at erdos schrenner random networks that in the limit of large n uh, are characterized by a degree distribution which is a Poisson distribution. So here the average degree is denoted by z and the condition for the existence of a global cascade reduces to this relationship where the uh, theta function has been um, implemented through this truncated summation. So the sum runs from 1 up to 1 over phi, because if uh, k is larger than 1 over phi, then uh, all of the contributions would be equal to 0. So this is the uh, relationship uh, 
that needs to be satisfied in an address running network in order to have a global cascade. So if we perform the sum, we uh, find that the condition can be written in terms of gamma functions, in particular uh, the ratio between an incomplete gamma function and, and uh, a gamma function. Uh, and so we have a condition as a function of the two parameters of the model, the threshold phi and the average degree, which is the only uh, parameter that describes the, uh, the Poisson random graph. So in this figure, what we, what I did was to plot these, uh, the left hand side of this uh, of this inequality. So that's the blue line. So when the blue line is above one, one is the straight dashed line. When the blue line is above one, then it means that there is uh, a, a solution of the equation s prime larger than zero. So here, global cascades can occur with a non-zero probability. Otherwise, global cascades have zero probability to be observed. And we see the existence of three regions here. So a region of small average, so here I am plotting it as a function of the average degree for a given value of the threshold. We will see in the next slide a, a phase diagram that also includes different values of the threshold. So. Um, there are three regions in this uh, in this figure uh, a region of small relatively small average degree where there is no probability of observing global cascades because the blue line is smaller than one a region of large enough average degrees where there is again no probability of observing global cascades because the red li the blue line is below the red line and then there is an intermediate region a window of values for the average degree when global cascades can occur with a non-zero probability. So the reason of this behavior is, uh, or the intuition behind this behavior is relatively simple. So if the average degree is small, so if in particular if there is no giant component, then it's impossible to observe global cascades just because nodes are not connected between them. So there is no chance to reach a large or a sizable fraction of nodes. So if the degree on the other hand uh, becomes very large or relatively large large enough uh, what happens is that uh, it's very difficult to convince nodes to become active because uh, essentially the the number of their neighbors that need to be active in order for them to uh, to become active uh, is larger so it's um, it's hard to find vulnerable nodes in between we have the situation where we have a giant component, so there is the possibility to, uh, to reach a large number of networks through paths that connect uh, different nodes. And at the same time, we have a significant number of vulnerable nodes. So we are in the uh, perfect situ situation when cascades can, uh, can actually occur. So this is the reason of this non-monotonicity. So if the average degree is very low, the network may not have a giant component, so only a few nodes can be activated. We might have cascades, but they are not global because the, their size is vanishing in the thermodynamic limit. If the average degree is high enough, nodes uh, need many active neighbors in order to become active themselves, and so cascades are unlikely because there are no, or there are few, um, too few vulnerable nodes. In between, can, cascades can occur because the network is connected, there is a giant component, and there are enough nodes that can be activated by uh, a few active neighbors. So here is the phase diagram as a function of the average degree on the y-axis and the activation threshold on the x-axis. So the uh, black line here is drawn in correspondence to uh, the equality. So when uh, this quantity in the left-hand side of the inequality is equal to 1, 
so it's the critical point. Uh, and we see that there are two regions, one where global cascades do occur and one where global cascades not occur. So we see that if we fix uh, a value for the threshold, for instance 0 0.2 here, we recover what we have just seen in the previous plot, so we, we have a uh, zero probability of observing global cascades for low average degrees, then we enter a region where global cascades can occur, and then again for large enough average degrees, the uh, cascades, global cascades cannot be triggered anymore. On the other hand, if we fix a value of the average degree, what we see is that by increasing the threshold at a certain point, we go from a situation where a global cascade can occur with non-zero probability to a situation where global cascades cannot occur anymore. So there is this critical, uh, critical line here. We also observe that there is a value of the threshold above which no global cascades occur independently of the value of the average degree of the network. So here, for all values of z, global cascades cannot occur. And that's because there are no, not enough vulnerable nodes. Because the activation threshold is, is very large. So, so far we have been looking at just uh, trying to identify the region where a global cascade can occur, we have not been looking at what is the actual probability of observing a global cascade. So, I mean, we have derived an equation for this quantity, this equation here, but then we haven't solved the equation. The equation can be solved, for instance, numerically, and by solving it we can compute the probability of observing a global cascade in the network. So this is a figure taken from the original paper of Duncan Watts um, that compares the solution, the analytical solution on Airbus Friendly Random Networks uh, with the results of numerical simulations. So let's look at this uh, line here that corresponds to this label frequency. So the line is the result of the uh, theoretical calculation, so it's the solution of the equation for S. The dots are, or the circles, are results from numerical simulations. So you see that um, the two match quite well, so the, um, the quantity S actually does represent the probability of observing a global cascade. There is some discrepancy close to the uh, second phase transition, but that's just because uh, of numerical uh, finite size effects. So the second, um, so we see again that the probability of observing a global cascade is non-monotonic. So it is equal to zero, then the giant component emerges, the probability is different from zero, increases, then it decreases and eventually becomes zero at the second phase transition. Um, the second uh, quantity that is interesting, so this line here just tells you the probability of observing a global cascade, but what is the actual size of the global cascade? So given that a global cascade occurs, does it affect uh, the entire system or only 20% of the system, 30%? What is the actual size of the cascade? So this is computed uh, here in this monotonic line which is labeled as size, and again here you have a comparison between numerical simulations that are the dots and a analytical curve which is the uh, curve for the size of the giant component of the network, just the giant component, no, uh, no vulnerable nodes, just the giant component. And you see that the two match very well. So the message here is that once a global cascade occurs, then it will affect all of the nodes that belong to the giant component in the thermodynamic.
So this, this is, of course, a conditional average. It's conditional on the fact that there is a global cascade. It's not the average size of cascades, but it's the average size of global cascades. An important thing to notice is also that close to this second critical point, when the probability of observing a global cascade uh, from being non-zero becomes zero uh, by increasing the average degree, so close to the second critical point, we have a relatively small probability of observing a global cascade, but a very large size of global cascades. So here we are in a situation where it's very unlikely to observe a global cascade, but whenever a global cascade is observed, the entire system is eventually activated, or almost uh, the entire system is eventually activated. So to summarize this uh, first lecture, we discussed the simple model of global cascades on networks introduced by Duncan Watts in 2002. So the model is simple, but it, uh, it has a very interesting phenomenology. We have computed a condition for the existence of global cascades. We have considered the situation when, uh, at the beginning, only one node is active, and we asked the question, of whether this initial activation of one node will eventually lead to uh, the activation of a sizable uh, fraction of the network. We have derived a condition for the occurrence of these, uh, uh, of these global cascades for the configuration model. And we have seen in particular that the probability of observing a global cascade is a non-monotonic function of the average degree. We have seen it for the uh, for the case of the erdos rheny random network, but it can be uh, observed also for other networks. And we have also seen that the average size of global cascades is instead monotonic, and it is uh, well approximated by the size of the giant cluster. Sorry, the gi giant uh, um, connected component. Now, of course, the results that we have derived uh, have been derived under some assumptions. So we have considered the uh, configuration model. We have considered that the threshold was the same for all nodes. This is not really important because uh, generalized uh, versions of the condition that we have derived can be, uh, can be obtained for a distribution of values for, for the thresholds, for the activation thresholds. We have considered Di uh, undirected networks, and we have considered unweighted networks. So all these uh, results can be generalized to the case of directed networks and uh, weighted networks. In fact, in the next lecture, we will see uh, an example of, um, of such generalization.